got your Bibles open to Acts chapter 9 and Philippians chapter 3, it's really important that you have both of these open today uh, because more than preach a certain text, I'm going to be preaching about uh, the conversion of a guy named Saul. Last week, if you were here, Wayne, uh, we had a live stream, Wayne talked about uh, the, a guy named Stephen on the live stream and talked about uh, how Stephen was a person who was willing to do the hard things, so much so that if you were here, you can go back and read this in Acts chapter 7 too if you weren't. Stephen was so adamant about preaching the gospel to the point that he was willing to give his life up for the gospel, and they people stoned him to death for preaching the gospel. Now, there was one really important fact on the tail end of that, of that message. Uh, if you go back and read it, at the end of Acts chapter 7, when they pick up stones to stone on Stephen, uh, the Bible gives us a, this little tidbit. It says, and there was a man who they, uh, who the people who were stolen, they laid his garment, their garments at his feet, and his name was Saul, and Saul oversaw the execution, and Saul approved of Stephen's execution. And today what I want us to do is I want us to look at who this person named Saul was, and I want us to figure out... Uh, what happened in Saul's life that Saul would go on to become the Apostle Paul and outside of Jesus Christ well, is pro has probably had more influence on the world than any other person who's ever been born or anybody else in your Bible. Now, that's a big statement, all right? So I'm saying outside of Jesus, Paul goes on to have the biggest influence out of anybody in the Bible. Um, we're talking about people in the Bible like Moses and David and Noah, all right? These are, these are pretty important people. But we're going to look at Saul today who goes on to become the Apostle Paul and has even bigger impact than all those people that really laid a pathway for the gospel to get here to us today. So I want us to look at, and I want us to figure out who this guy named Saul actually is. So if you got your Bibles, we're going to be in Philippians 3 first. And I want us to answer this question. Who is Saul? Who was Saul? All right, this is what the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, starting in verse 1. Paul writes, Finally, my brothers, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you is no trouble to me and is safe for you. Look out for the dogs. Look out for the evildoers. Look out for those who mutilate the flesh. So just a little idea of what's going on here. Paul is writing to the church at Philippi, warning them against some false teachers who are trying to sneak in here at Philippi. All right, But that, that's not really what I want you guys to notice today. But what I want you to notice is what Paul says about himself. Verse 3. For we are the circumcision who worship by the Spirit of God and glory in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in the flesh. Verse 4. Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh also. Now, notice what Paul's saying before, I, before we look at, look at how Paul describes himself before he became Paul. Paul is saying that we don't put any stock in worldly things, okay? He's saying uh, worldly uh, attributes, worldly possessions, worldly characteristics are of no use to us who are Christians. But in verse 4, he goes back into who he was before he was Paul, and he says this, Though I myself have reason for confidence in the flesh, if anyone else thinks he has reason for confidence in the flesh, I have more. I, lo I love that one, that, that statement there. I have more. Here's what Paul just said. I am better than you in every way, and I know it. Okay? When he says, I have more, he's literally saying, we don't put any stock in worldly characteristics. But if you want to compare worldly characteristics, we can do that because I'm better than you, right? Paul's not a humble guy, right? Like, before Paul, but, uh, when Paul was Saul, Saul was not humble. I, I love this. He's, he's basically saying, Hey, you're smart, I'm smarter. You're rich, I'm richer, right? Well, we don't like people like this, but Paul is saying this is who I was before I was in Christ. Verse 5, this is what he says. I was circumcised on the eighth day. Well, the, to, be a, to be a ritually pure Jew, you were circumcised on the eighth day after your birth. He says, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin. And when he, say, he throws out the tribe of Benjamin there because that's the most prominent tribe, right? He's saying, not only am I a ritually pure, Jew, uh, ritually pure Jew, I'm from the best tribe. And he says, I am a Hebrew of Hebrews. So of all the, of all the Hebrew people, I am the best Hebrew person. As to the law of Pharisee, 
The fact that he's a Pharisee meant that he was educated, that he was smart. We're talking about somebody who had the best education that was possible in first century Palestine. We're talking about somebody who had probably memorized the entire Torah, okay? That he, so we're talking Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, and Deuteronomy. You don't even like to read those when it comes up in your Bible reading plan. And Paul's saying, I had those memorized, okay? He says, a Pharisee, as to zeal, a persecutor of the church. He said, when it comes to how passionate I was about my religion, I was willing to kill people over my religion, Right? See, and this, is, this should be kind of convicting for us. Most of us are not willing to open our mouth about Jesus Christ, but before Paul was even saved, he was willing to kill folks for about Jesus Christ, okay? As to zeal, a persecutor of the church, and as to righteousness under the law, blameless. Let me, that last statement right here where it says righteousness under the law, uh, the Pharisees believe that there are 611 Old Testament laws prescribed that you need to keep in order to be pure before God. And here's what Paul says. As to the law, all 611 laws, I was blameless. This is who Saul is before he meets Jesus. And here's the, here's the basic gist of why I want us to read. Uh, we're going to come back to the rest of Philippians in just a second. What I want you to see is that before Saul met Jesus, he is a man, he is a man steadfast against Jesus. He not only dislikes Jesus, he dislikes those who like Jesus to the point that he is willing to kill them. All of that changes when Saul actually meets Jesus for himself, though. And so this morning, what I want us to do, you can turn back in your Bibles to Acts 9. I want us to look at what happened when Saul met Jesus, okay? I want us to see what happened in the life transformation that happened. And ultimately, I want us to see that the story of God saving Saul, the story of the Apostle Paul becoming, uh, the, the man named Saul becoming the Apostle Paul, the story of the gospel changing people's lives is the ultimate mission of the church. So look with me in Acts chapter 9, and let, let, let's, uh, let's see how this story speaks to us today. Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1, this is what the Bible says. But Saul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord, went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus. Here's what that means. Saul had been in Jerusalem, and he had been threatening people and rounding up people and taking them to jail and even murdering people. And now he, he hates Christians so much that just doing it in Jerusalem is not good enough for him. Now he's going to go to Damascus and round up Christians there and kill them too, okay? That's what Saul's after here. So that if he found any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. Now, as he went on his way, he approached Damascus. And suddenly, a light shone from heaven around him, and falling to the ground, he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And he answered and said, Who are you, Lord? I want you to notice his response here. He doesn't know the identity of the man talking to him, but he does know that he's a person of authority and power. So basically, he doesn't know at this point that it's Jesus talking to him, but he does know it's God, okay? But he says, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. But rise and enter the city, and you will be told what you are to do. All right, side note right here, this is completely free. I want you to notice how it is that Paul becomes a Christian, okay? See, we like, and this is, this is completely free, so don't, you don't have to write this down, but I, I think it's important that we notice how people are saved, okay? We like to think that people are saved once they've been coming to church long enough, they walk down front, say a prayer, repeat after me, sinner's prayer, and then they're saved, okay? What I want you to see from Scripture is that a person is saved when they meet Jesus. Paul didn't say, repeat after me. Paul didn't come down front, fill out a membership card, get baptized. Paul met Jesus, and his life was different. The men who were traveling with him stood speechless, hearing the voice but seeing no one. Saul rose from the ground, and though, although his eyes were open, he saw nothing. So they led him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. And for three days he was without sight and neither ate nor drank. 
Now there was a disciple at Damascus named Ananias, and the Lord said to him in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Here I am, Lord. And the Lord said to him, Rise and go to the street called Straight, and at the house of Judas look for a man named, named of Tarsus named Saul, for behold, he is praying, and he has seen in a vision a man named Ananias come in and lay his hands on him so that he might regain his sight. Verse 13. This is going to be important for later. But Ananias answered, Lord, I have heard from many about this man and how much evil he has done to your saints. And here he has authority from the chief priest to bind all who call upon your name. I have to tell you, this is just like Christians today. God wants to save somebody, and our response to that is that person, God? God, I don't like them. Don't nobody like them. You want to save that person? You want to save, God, you want to save Kanye? Oh, y'all ain't been on Facebook. Y'all ain't seen Kanye got saved. Y'all need y'all y'all living under a rock. We're gonna talk about Kanye in just a minute. All right. The only time you'll ever hear Kanye West is a sermon illustration in today's message. Okay. But we God says I'm gonna save the worst of the worst. And Christians, we tend to forget that we were once worst of the worst, and we respond like Ananias. Really, God, that person? You want me to? You want me to witness to who? Verse 15. But the Lord said to him. Go, for he is a chosen instrument of mine to carry my name before the Gentiles and kings and children of Israel. Notice the determining factor in somebody's salvation here. It's not what Paul had done at one point. It's that right now, at the very moment that God saved him, God, God says he is a chosen instrument of mine. That's my child. For I will show him how much he must suffer for the sake of my name. So Ananias departed and entered the house, and laying his hands on him, said, Brother Saul, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road by who appeared to you on the road by which you came has sent me that you may regain your sight and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from his eyes, and he regained his sight. Then he rose and was baptized, and taking food, he was strengthened. There's a couple things I want us to see today based on not only based on the story of Saul, so I'm not going to necessarily pull things out of Acts chapter 9, but based on the testimony we have here of Paul, there's a few things that I feel like as we consider what it means for us to go all in that we need to weigh personally and think about, uh, about his testimony. Here's the first thing. What I want us to see about Paul's testimony is this. The gospel is the mission. Now, if you're taking notes, that might sound weird, and I'll explain that, but I want you to kind of write that down because I want you to be able to think through with me. The gospel is the mission. What's the gospel? The gospel is the good news. Literally, the word gospel means good news. And the gospel is the good news of Jesus Christ, life, death, and resurrection, okay? It is the good news that Jesus Christ has come to earth and has a personal affection in you and in me. Now, this message, this gospel, this good news is the mission of the church, and it is the purpose of our life, okay? My dad, growing up, would say it this way, and I, uh, uh, things, it's funny how things stick with you, but he would, say, he would tell it to me like this, Son, our mission on earth is to go to heaven, to make it to heaven, and to take as many people with us as we possibly can. So that's, that's what I mean when I say the gospel is the mission. See, the centerpiece of this story here is that the fact that before Paul met Jesus, he hated Jesus. But when Paul met Jesus, everything changed. And so what I want us to see here is that us introducing Jesus Christ to other people is the purpose for our lives. This, this story playing out in other people's lives is the reason for which we have been given breath on a daily basis. See, we all walk through life and we have a ton of purposes, okay? We want to be good husbands, good wives. We want to be good bosses. We want to be good employees. We want to be good fathers, good mothers. But what we learn from this testimony is that the most important role we have in life is being a bearer or a steward of this gospel message because this is what we want to happen in the world around us. We want people who don't know Jesus and people who hate Jesus to meet Jesus and leave changed. And this is really important for us to think about as we start considering what it means for us to go all in in the future. 
So for the last few weeks, what I've done is I've stood up here and I've told you guys, guys, if we go all in, we can go uh, to foreign countries and, and we can build uh, stuff in foreign countries, churches in foreign countries, train pastors in foreign countries. Well, I've told you that if we go all in, we have the potential to build a house for, ho- for uh, homeless people here in the upstate. I've told you that we're going to give so much money to missions or we're going to help the recovering addicts. We're going to do all these things, right? And all that's good. But here's what, I, here's what we have to remember. As we're thinking about the ways we're going to expand our mission, it would be really easy to focus on going out and meeting the felt needs of people. Well, this person's an addict. They need some help in recovery. This person's homeless. They need a home. This person needs this, and that person needs that. And here's what I want you to remember. We cannot, in, help, in meeting the needs of other people, forget the main thing. And the main thing, the, the main thing that we're going forward with is not building the house or, or training pastors, but introducing people to Jesus Christ. The main thing we want to push the mission forward with is the name of Jesus going forward. So understand when I say this, the mission is the gospel, and the gospel is the mission. Which, and as I was as I was putting this together, I think the thing that God convicted me most on when I started weighing this out, it, it was a was a question. I want to ask it to you. If the gospel is the purpose of our lives, like God has put me on this earth to be a steward of this message, now the one question we have to ask ourselves is this: Are we passionate about this message and about this mission? You can ask it this way. Do I care if other people meet Jesus? See, because the truth is, once a human has experienced good news, we are hardwired to share that good news. We cannot help it. We, we are programmed like, like computers to share that good news with other people. It's in our DNA. It's the way God made us. This is why things like social media have been so effective in the 21st century. You know why? Because we love telling people good news. Best illustration I can give you of this is a Facebook official relationship, right? Uh, so I got some millennials are laughing, okay? Thank you. Uh, right? If you're, if you're over like maybe 40, maybe you didn't have to go through this, all right? But the way you knew you were serious with somebody uh, when I was growing up is if it was Facebook official, right? You weren't, in a, you weren't in a serious relationship until you could go on Facebook and make it Facebook official and tell the whole world, right? And now, so I, I think back to when me and Jenna uh, first started dating, right? We've been talking for, heck, probably, probably six or seven months. She would probably tell you longer than that. Um, and we're not going to tell you why it took six or seven months because this guy might have been a punk, okay? Uh, but me and Jenna had been talking for six or seven months, and I could not wait until I could go on Facebook and put on Facebook that I was Facebook official in a relationship with Jenna. It was Jenna Daly at the time, right? I was like, man, I can't wait to share that information, right? I was like, man, I'm 17, she's 23, I make zero dollars, and she's a pharmacist. I'm a five, and she's a 10. I could not wait to share that, all right? And why? Why is that? Because we are programmed to share good news. So the que- when, when it comes back to the gospel, the question we have to think about is if we are programmed to share good news, are we passionate about sharing the good news of Jesus Christ? And if we're not, it must be because we've never experienced the good news ourselves. See, I, I, I think it, it's good to think about it this way. If we are not sharing the gospel, it's a good sign we don't consider it good news at all. We love to share good news. So what burdens my heart is if you are not passionate about sharing the good news of Jesus, if you're not passionate about other people meeting Jesus, I have to ask you the question, are you sure that you've met Jesus? Because once we have that good news, we can't keep it to ourselves. That's the first thing I want us to see about Paul's testimony. Here's the second thing. second thing we need to notice about Paul's testimony is this. The gospel can change anyone. The gospel can change anyone. Paul, in this story, is literally the most unlikely person imaginable you would think to get saved. Right? Like when Ananias had his, here's what I can promise you. Ananias had his little prayer list like we have praying for people to get saved. On the top of the list was not uh, Saul, the persecutor of the church, was not Paul. Why? Because nobody thought this dude would get saved, right? 
the example for this uh, and that I can give you for today is I've been praying for people to get saved for a while. All right? You know who wasn't on the top of my list this week? Kanye. All right? Kanye West. Now, if you hadn't, if you hadn't been on Facebook like you're living under a rock and you hadn't seen this, okay? Evidently, Kanye West, the rapper, the mogul, all right, ha- has... um. Has been converted and become a Christian, right? This is like literally all over news. It's all over late night, and and it's all. Like he did an interview with Jimmy Fallon, and Jimmy Fallon or Jimmy Kimmel, one of them asked him. They said, "Would you consider yourself to be a Christian rapper now?" And his answer was, "I just consider myself to be a Christian everything now, right? Like it seems like it seems legit, but." When I, been, when I was praying this past week for people to be saved, let me tell you who wasn't at the top of my list. Kanye, right? Because I didn't think Kanye was a likely candidate. And that's the same thing for Paul here, right? Paul here is the most unimagin- unlikely person imaginable to be saved. But unlikely does not mean impossible. And so this is why we don't give up hope on people. Because if God can save Paul, God can save anybody. And this is uh, uh, using, using Conway's illustration. Let me, let me just assure you this. I don't know if God saved Kanye West. Here's what I do know. God can save Kanye West. Because God can save whoever he wants, whenever he wants. And I can promise you God can save Kanye West because if God can save me, he can save anybody. Because the Bible says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm the greatest of all sinners. But so often we forget that as Christians. We forget. We look at the outside world, and we think the outside world's full of sin, and we think, man, we're, we weren't that bad when God saved us. God didn't have to work that hard to save us. And what we forget is that we were just like Saul here, the most unlikely, unimaginable person ever to get saved. But un- unlikely does not mean impossible, because me and you are sitting right here. Look what happened when Paul when Paul met Jesus. Philippians, if you got your Bible, you might want to flip back with me to Philippians. It's Philippians 3. I love how what he says happened to him, okay? Philippians 3 says this. Whatever gain I had, I counted as loss for the sake of Christ. This is verse 7, verse 8. Indeed, I count everything as loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have suffered the loss of of all things, and count them as rubbish in order that I might gain Christ. Let's stop right here. We're going to come back to the rest of it in just a second. Know what Paul's saying here. Paul's saying, I literally had everything I could have wanted in the world. He said, if anybody else thought they had reason for boasting, I had more. But when all of that stacked up next to Jesus, I, he said, I counted it all as lost. The word he uses here is I counted it all as rubbish. Now, let me, let me just give you a little inside track on what that word rubbish means in the Greek. If, if Danny, came, the, word, the word that Paul uses here is the Greek word skubalon, okay? If Danny walked into me tomorrow, walked into my room, and she said, Daddy, I need you to throw away this skubalon, I would take Danny to the kitchen sink, pour some Dawn dish detergent in my hand, and put it in her mouth, okay? Because that's the kind of Greek word that Paul is using here. Paul is saying, in the Greek, this is a word that means that means trash, that means garbage, that means refuse, that can literally be equated with the Greek, the English word dung. So get what Paul's saying. Everything I had before I had Jesus is like a big pile of trash that is worthless to me. And I count it all as lost that I might have one thing, Jesus. You see, this is what the gospel does in people. This is why the gospel can change anybody, because it gives us something in Christ that makes the rest of the world pale in comparison. So that if we have everything, but we don't have Jesus, we have nothing. But if we have nothing and we have Jesus, we have everything. That is how the gospel changes changes us. It makes us look at the outside world and say all of that is worthless next to Jesus. And here's what we got to remember. The gospel can do this for anybody. And we're going all in as a church. We're asking you to go all in because we believe if we carry this message to the outside world, the gospel will do this for anybody who calls on the name of Jesus. So the gospel is the mission. The gospel can change anyone. Here's the last thing I want you to see. The gospel is the power for every believer. You know, so many, so many times, and this is going, we're going to come back to Philippians 3.10 here, so if you've got your Bible, keep it there. So many times, though, what happens is, as we read the story 
uh, of Paul's transformation or we hear about somebody being saved. And the way we view the gospel is that the gospel is something that you need to at one at one time to come in and, and, and pray to God about and be saved. So you need the good news of Jesus to be saved at first. And then when you're done with that, you leave that at the altar and you just go out and you try to be a better person because that's what being a Christian is all about, right? You believe and then you, you move on to something else. But I want you to see here that we don't just go all in because the gospel is something we need at one point for salvation. We go all in because the gospel is the power of God, not just for eternal life, but the gospel is the power of God for everyday life. Look at Philippians chapter 3, verse 10. I want you to see how Paul puts this. Well, well, I have to start in verse 9. This is what the Bible says. And be found, I want to be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which comes through faith in Christ, the righteousness from God that depends on, on faith. Verse 10. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and may share his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, that by any means possible I may attain the resurrection from the dead. You see, Paul, the gospel to Paul is not something he believed at one time and then left it on the altar and walked out and started moving on to other things. Paul here, it says the gospel is something that gives him the power for everyday life. It is his purpose every single day. He says that by any means possible, I may attain to the resurrection from the dead. I love the image here because for most of us, we think about, man, when we die, what is, it's going to be peaceful, and we're just going to pass from this life right on into the next. And the image Paul is laying hold of here is that he is fighting so hard to know Jesus that, man, he's fighting against the devil, and he's fighting for people to know the mission, and he is clawing and scratching that he said, by any means necessary that I may attain their eternal life, that when he actually dies, he's going to look up and be surprised he's in heaven because he's been so intense in a fight. Because every day he's been laying hold of Jesus, and Jesus, i got to have you today. Jesus, i got to have you today. And nothing else matters except putting his eyes on Jesus. See, because the gospel to Paul is more than yesterday's spiritual headline. It's today's lifeline. Like, he's waking up saying, Jesus, i got to have you today. And the question we've got we've to ask ourselves is, does that describe us? Are we the kind of people who made a profession at one point and then we just left Jesus behind and we're trying our best to, to do, make it through life now, or are we the kind of people like Paul here who are saying, God, above anything else, above everything else, every day I'm going to scratch and claw to know you because you're all that matters. So here's what I want us to kind of think about as we close. I want to challenge you with the questions that God's been challenging me with. And I want to ask you to consider your, consider whether you are like Paul in these ways or not, because here's what I want you to know. In order to go all in, that we have to be described by the kind of life that Paul is talking about here, where we're casting everything else aside, and we're setting our eyes and our heart on Jesus, and we're saying, Jesus, you're all that matters, and you're all I want. And so I really want to close with you with two questions that God's been convicting me about this week as I've thought about this sermon. And the first question is this. Are you more passionate about the gospel than anything else? Are you passionate about sharing the gospel with other people? Because as I look at my own life, the concern for me becomes that people can easily look at me and know I'm passionate about several things. Man, if you've been, if you've been around me for any amount of time, you know man, I love my wife. I love my, my little girl. Man, I, I'm crazy about them. You know that I'm crazy about Georgia football, and I love CrossFit and all these things. Like, man, you know I'm passionate about that. My concern is not that you know I'm passionate about that. My concern is I pray to God that I'm known as the kind of man who loves Jesus more than all of those things. That if somebody thinks about me when they're not in this place, they would say, man, that Dallas, the, the first thing that comes to their mind would not be, man, Dallas loves Jenna, Dallas loves Danny. I honestly pray, man, God is breaking me apart for this, that the first thought that would come to their mind is, man, Dallas loves Jesus. And so i got to ask you, that's, as God's asked me that, are you passionate about the message of Jesus Christ more than anything else. Because if you're not passionate about other people knowing Jesus, here's the bottom line that concerns me. 
And this is so convicting for me to even say. If you're not passionate about other people meeting Jesus, my concern is that you've never met Jesus. And I want to, last thing I want to ask us is this. Are we the kind of people that Paul described in Philippians 3.10? That above anything and everything else, God, I'm waking up day in and day out not to live for the things of this world, not to focus on trivial matters, not to focus on things that are here one day and gone the next, but to say by any means necessary, I'm going to go after Jesus today. I'm going to lay hold of Jesus today. I'm going to fight to know Jesus today. Because if not, we haven't yet figured out what it means to go all in. I want to put, there's a quote on the screen I want to read to you that I think kind of, encapsulate what, what's Paul saying in, in Philippians 3, 10 and 11. This is Mark Batterson. It says this, We want joy without sacrifice. We want character without suffering. We want success without failure. We want gain without pain. We want a testimony without a test. We want it all without going all in. Are we the kind of people who say, Jesus, I'm all in. I'm after you. You're all I want no matter what. Or do we just want the benefits of him without all the suffering that goes along with him? You notice what Paul said in Philippians 3, verse 11, or verse 10. He said, that I may know the power of his resurrection, and listen to this, and share in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death. Because the only way, listen, to experience all the power of God is to die the death that you need to die here. The only way to tap into the spiritual power of Jesus is to live in the self-denial that God's called us to here. But so many of us want to go up, want it all without going all in. So my question for us today, as we close out week four, man, we got one more week of all in. My question for us today is, are we willing to go all in so that we might have all of Jesus? Are we willing to go all in so that we can have all of Jesus. Let's pray. God, I pray, Lord, that you would um, honestly, dear God, just use the foolish ramblings of a man, dear God. Dear God, this message um, came together, dear God, throughout the week so in, in just a different way, dear God. And I pray, Lord, that if I said anything that you didn't want me to say, dear God, or I didn't say something you did want me to say, I pray that you would forgive me, God. God, I, I just pray that you would use the foolish ramblings of a man to glorify your name this morning. And God, I pray that we might be willing to go all in, Jesus, moving forward, so that we can have all of you. In Jesus' name I pray.